Between 1669 and 1705, a series of discoveries were made which, though apparently unrelated, would go on to revitalize the study of electricity in Europe, which had languished since the time of Otto von Guericke. It's a testament to the uneven and unusual path science sometimes takes, so we can start our story there. In 1669, by most accounts, the merchant and alchemist Hennig Brandt, or Heinrich Brandt, discovered the element phosphorus. He discovered the substance during his attempts to produce the philosopher's stone, considered one of the highest achievements in alchemy. Attempting to synthesize the stone could be done according to several different texts. Depending on the author and one's interpretation, many laborious tasks might be involved, such as boiling, reducing, distilling, burning, and crystallizing, taking days or weeks of careful attention. In Brandt's attempt, one of the steps involved an unusual ingredient, human urine, hundreds of gallons of human urine. He boiled the urine, reducing it over a period of weeks, before heating it in a retort at the highest temperature he could manage. This produced a white vapor, which formed drops that glowed brilliantly for long stretches of time. The name phosphorus was coined, derived from the ancient Greek word meaning light-bearing. For a time, this was the only method of producing phosphorus, despite the unpleasant nature of the work. Dr. Samuel Wall was reportedly asked by Robert Boyle around the year 1680, ten years after the discovery of the element, to try and use all his endeavors to find out some subject from whence it might be made in greater quantity, since Boyle said he really pitied his chemist, who was forced to evaporate so prodigious a quantity of urine to get a very little of the phosphorus. Wall was successful, using the dried matter in the fields where they emptied the houses of office, which could be broken up to reveal small bits of phosphorus and these bits could then be distilled, producing greater quantities of the element. So profitable was this endeavor that Robert Boyle's chemist, who used Wall's method, became exceedingly rich, sufficiently so that he promptly left England altogether, much to Boyle's dismay. With this improved method of manufacturing phosphorus, its light-producing properties could be studied more widely. The phosphorus light was occasionally compared to another recent discovery, made in the year 1676, where it was found that the mercury in a barometer could produce light when shaken, this was therefore termed the mercurial phosphor, and it aroused some interest in the scientific communities of Europe. Between 1700 and 1701, Johann Bernoulli the Elder read his letters to Pierre Varignon before the French Academy of Science about his theory of this mysterious light. Bernoulli's letters were most likely the motivation for one Francis Hawksby, who had entered the service of the Royal Society of London in 1703 to begin experimenting with the mercurial phosphor in 1705 and it was Hawksby's experiments that perhaps first led people to connect the mercurial phosphor to the phenomenon of electricity. There are two different stories that I want to tell in this video. The first is the story of Francis Hawksby and how his series of experiments performed over a period of several years served to deepen the understanding of electricity in his time. The second story is my own, reconstructing Hawksby's machine and rediscovering some of the challenges of performing electrical experiments with the available tools. I first began this project in late 2022, about a year and a half ago, and in that time I've seen a lot of changes in my own life, but I've managed to fit in quite a few hours tinkering on this project. I've also retaken up my research into Hawksby several times, writing and rewriting scripts, and at this point I'm sure I could fill an hour-long video just talking about the history and progression of Hawksby's work. But outside of hardcore academics, I'm not sure there would be much interest in such an in-depth work, so I'm going to try and split the difference and keep this video to a reasonable runtime, interweaving Hawksby's story with my own as best I can. To better understand Hawksby's experiments, I began by reconstructing his machine the way he originally drew it. You can find the build process in another video. As time went on, I made continual improvements to the machine and its attachments, many of which you'll see throughout this video. Hawksby himself did not have all the improvements you'll see here. For example, I made a leather rubber pad, which was spring-loaded against the rotating globe, which was much more consistent and easier to use during experiments. This sort of thing would not actually come into use until later in the 1700s. I also made use of a plastic fishbowl as a globe, which was easier to electrify than the original glass globe I had. Occasionally, I made use of what's called a primary conductor, a large metal object that could accumulate charge due to its larger surface area. Such devices were still decades away from being used when Hawksby made his experiments. In other ways, Hawksby's apparatus was more sophisticated than my own. 
He had access to glassworks with custom brass fittings to provide a way of connecting his globes to a vacuum pump. In place of something like epoxy, glass metal joints were sealed with either wet leather, if the vacuum would provide the sealing force, or letter sealing wax, which was used as a vacuum cement, even up until the early 20th century. While I experimented briefly with traditional sealing wax as a cement, and with pulling a vacuum on my own globes while mounted in the machine, these attempts met with mixed success. So, I've explained some of the finer points about these experiments. Let's turn to Hawksby himself and how he made his mark on scientific history. There's no existing portrait of Francis Hawksby. One that sometimes appears is actually a portrait of 17th century mathematician James Gregory. What biographical information we have comes mostly from record keeping and newspaper advertisements. In the Postman newspaper of London, Hawksby would advertise instruments such as his air pump as early as 1701. By that time, his interest in vacuum science had clearly taken hold, and his reputation in and integration with the scientific community of London must have been increasing, or else he would not have been aware of the fairly new phenomena of phosphorus and the mercurial phosphor. While Bernoulli's letters on mercurial phosphor might explain how Hawksby came across that particular effect, his study of phosphorus could have come from another source, Robert Boyle, the famed Irish scientist and philosopher who had developed a greatly improved vacuum pump, and who had made a lengthy study of phosphorus following its discovery. In fact, this awareness of phosphorus may be what led him to Bernoulli and the mercurial phosphor, but this is just my conjecture. Between 1705 and 1707, Hawksby would go from total unawareness of electrical effects to completing the majority of his novel electrical experiments. The experiments were generally made before the Royal Society as well as to visitors in his home. His path from phosphorus to electricity demonstrates his excellent deductive abilities, performing experiments based on theory and updating theory based on experiments, letting no small detail escape observation. Now, here's Hawksby's path from phosphorus to electricity. Beginning in early 1705, he studied the glowing nature of the element phosphorus in vacuum. Within a few months, he was studying another glowing effect in vacuum, the mercurial phosphor. His aim was initially to determine what motion is causing the glowing effect in the top of a barometer. He passed air through some mercury in a glass vessel to agitate it, causing it to bubble onto the sides of the glass, shown in the drawing here, which produced a fireworks display of light. This effect was produced whenever the air pressure was low and there was motion between the mercury and the glass. And so he asks, which holds this light producing quality, the mercury or the glass, or both? By December of that year, only a couple months later, he had developed his first electrical machine, comprising a large wheel turning a spindle that passes through a vacuum chamber or a receiver. With this apparatus, he made a spinning carousel of amber beads, which could be rubbed against wool in vacuo, and found that they too produced light, but only where the amber and the wool came into contact. This sudden introduction of amber and wool here practically demands a connection with electricity, but no mention is yet made. The purpose is just to determine what materials, when rubbed together, will produce light in the way that mercury and glass produce light. With the same apparatus, a piece of glass is rubbed against wool in vacuo. Light is again produced and is diminished as air is let in. This behavior is very similar to what was seen with the mercury and the glass, but Hawksby's careful not to conclude prematurely that the glass is holding the phosphorescent nature. He continues his experiments by rubbing glass near glass, both in vacuo and in open air, and finds that light is again produced. Curiosity leads him to now ask whether he can invert the apparatus and rub the exterior of a glass globe, which has its interior evacuated. Thus, by September 1706, he's led to develop a glass globe which is evacuated, and rubbing the outside of the globe, a dim light is produced on the inside. This effect was reproduced wonderfully in the documentary Shock and Awe. To quote Hawksby himself, The light appeared of a curious purple color, and was produced by a very slight and tender touch of the hands, the globe glass at the same time being hardly sensibly warm. Nor do I find a more immoderate attrition to advance the light anything, nor is the highest degree of rarefaction of the air in the globe absolutely necessary in the production of this light, for it seemed to continue very little lessened in its color or vigor, till, I believe, more than a fourth part of its air was let in. Here's my electrical machine. 
It's made from some common board, pine, a steel shaft, a wrench for the crank, and in this case, a fish bowl as the globe. The globe is turned using the hand crank, and you can use either a bare hand with light pressure or a leather pad, a so-called rubber, to generate the friction. But how can we really be sure it's electrified? There are a few ways. Hawksby used threads attached around a wire hoop, like I've constructed here. Some pack thread is wrapped around the loop, and silk threads are placed at regular intervals. With an unelectrified globe, the threads simply sway with the breeze created by the globe, but rubbing the globe even briefly is enough to bring the threads into action, extending directly towards the surface of the globe. My hoop is a bit cumbersome, the threads get stuck occasionally, but the results look exactly like Hawksby's drawings. What's more, I can reproduce the fleeing of the threads away from a finger. Trying to touch the threads causes them to repel away from my finger, and not in a way we'd expect from discharging them, but clearly an act of repulsion. Hawksby also demonstrated that this effect applies to the inside of the globe as well, with threads on the inside extending radially outwards towards the globe's surface. Jumping ahead a few decades, we could use the gold leaf electroscope. This one I made uses a strip of leaf brass, the sort used for gilding, carefully draped over a fine steel wire attached to the metal bulb at the top. When the top is near an electrically charged object, electrostatic induction causes excess charge on the leaves, which mutually repel. Bringing the top metal bulb towards the globe after rubbing clearly shows the separation of the leaves. Of course, a very simple way to detect the presence of charge is to simply turn out the lights, look closely, and listen for crackling. You can see my best attempts at capturing the sparks, which don't show up well on camera. A glow of corona discharge is also visible in person, especially after your eyes have adjusted to the dark. There's something really beautiful about doing these experiments late on a winter's night, lighting a candle with a match and becoming absorbed in the creaking and crackling of the electrical machine. In December 1706, Hawksby finally connects his experiments to electricity. It seems likely that it came from the members of the Royal Society viewing Hawksby's demonstrations. Isaac Newton, for example, suggested in early November of that year that the light might be due to effluvia leaving the glass. And just like that, the study of electricity is pushed forward for the first time in decades. Hawksby repeats many of the staple experiments of the 1600s attracting leaf brass and seeing it fly away, similar to Cabello's brass filings. Putting an electrified globe or cylinder near smoke and fire, which preoccupied so many of the previous experimenters, indicating the existence and direction of electric forces using silk threads tied to a wire hoop, and interposing a cloth and observing its ability to impede electricity. In addition to these replications, Hawksby observes a glow appearing between the glass and a hand nearby, even when the cylinder is not exhausted of air, along with sparking to the fingertips. Elaborating upon these experiments, Hawksby asks whether the rubbing can attract silk threads on the inside of the globe as well as the outside. By 1707, he has developed a new apparatus, which, though somewhat clumsy, does seem to verify that the electrical effects extend to the inside of the glass, as threads within would still be attracted to the globe surface when it is rubbed from without. From a theoretical perspective, this was surprising, 
Rubbing takes place on the outside of a piece of glass, and yet there's interaction with threads inside the glass, as if the effluvia were penetrating. Indeed, a still more striking example was then found. It was observed first that, when the threads on the outside of the globe are attracted and a hand is present nearby, the threads will fly my finger held on any side of it. This is another observation of electrical repulsion made years before its official discovery. But then the most surprising discovery of all, when the threads on the inside are attracted to the globe surface and a hand is presented near them on the outside of the glass, the threads perform the same action. In Hawksby's words, the body from which the effluvia is produced seeming to be no impediment to its motion. What then are we to make of the fact that even a coarse cloth of muslin can hinder all electrical activity while something as impermeable as glass poses no obstacle? Here at last is where we leave Francis Hawksby. His work continued, culminating in a book in 1709 summarizing his experiments, mostly adapting his papers read before the Royal Society. The mysteries of this electrical effluvia would not be revealed for many decades yet, and we have many more characters to meet on the journey towards modern electromagnetic experiments. And Hawksby's electrical machine will live on, a staple of all electrical experiments in the latter half of the 18th century, a celebration of his experimental genius. <laughs>